I think it's kind of cool that um, these three rogue states I talk about, North Korea, Iran, and Russia, their leaders are all five foot seven. I think that's interesting. You know, nobody talks about that. Different sizes. Different sizes and shapes, though. Small man syndrome, and, though. Maybe that's the biggest risk that no one's talking about, a small man syndrome. Ian, where does this podcast find you? I am in New York City, back home. Back from uh, the South Pole, Antarctica, is that right? Back from the South Pole, yeah. It was a crazy trip. I've always wanted to do it. It was uh, about as hard as I imagined, but was pretty rewarding. I'm glad I went. Yeah, that sounds... That sounds crazy, but a nice a nice escape. It seems like that is arguably the most stable place in the world. It is. It's the first um, arms control agreement that was signed between the U.S. and the Soviets, and that treaty from 1959 is holding true. Uh, will until 2048. That's the next time we have to all sit down and discuss it. There's no um, use for military exercises or basing. There's no natural resource exploitation. There are no uh, territorial disputes. And of course, there are no people particularly, which also makes it easier. Um, but yeah, it was nice to be in a piece of territory that was so big. Also, no internet. Uh, so it was like a week and a bit of just uh, just connecting with uh, with this little ball we're on. Uh, there were there worse okay. things to do at the beginning of the year. So. More penguins, that's the answer to world peace. Okay, so let's bust right into it. You published, or Eurasia Group published a list of the biggest risks in 2024, and I've already parroted it. I love that you said that Israel's at war with Hamas, Ukraine's at war with Russia, and America is at war with itself. Let's start there. America's at war with itself. Aren't we? Doesn't it feel that way? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Say more. Say more. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say it's all about Trump. Um, I, I think that Trump is a symptom, and he's certainly making it worse. But, you know, we, we put in the report, we went and we looked at American trust for all of these institutions in the country, the Supreme Court, Congress, the presidency, organized religion, public schools, newspaper, internet news. They've all been going down. They've all been going down for decades. They're reaching crisis levels. Three years of Biden as president. I mean, I, I'd like to believe that he is trying to uh, end this challenge, but he's not in any way been successful. The U.S. is more divided um, and polarized three years after the Biden presidency than it was when he first came in. So this is not going to get fixed no matter what the outcome of the election is. The stakes of the election are much higher. For Trump, they're jail. Uh, Biden and his team believe that if Trump wins, he will politicize the DOJ, the FBI, the IRS, and other organizations that they will face legal jeopardy themselves. So it's becoming increasingly existential on a personal basis for the leaders uh, of these two movements. And well before we get to the election itself, which is a very juicy target for people in and outside the U.S. that would like chaos in America and more broadly— um, you have the fact that Trump is very soon, very likely to get the nomination. And when he gets the nomination, he will become far more powerful immediately. He will have the Republican Party declaring loyalty to him with their media um, and with a lot of money. And that means that his policies, his stated policies, whether it's on Ukraine and ending support for Zelensky, or it's on the Middle East and showing the Iranians what's what, or it's on the border, or it's on the treatment of Muslims, or any trade with the Chinese, all of those will become policies, not that he's just throwing out there, but that are being supported by half of the country. And, and that has an impact well before the election in November. So for all of those reasons, it was inconceivable to me that we wouldn't have the United States as the top risk for 2024. And I say this as someone who, back when I started my company in 1998, we didn't even focus on domestic politics in the United States because it, a consolidated democracy, I mean, why would you bother? And and now, I mean, it's the most important focus. What do you think, uh, what are the root causes of this? Is it income inequality, young people not doing as well for the first time as older generations? Is it social media platforms that are polarizing us, including some that are controlled by, you might argue, bad actors? If you were to try and diagnose the underlying cancer, not just the tumor, but what is driving division in the U.S., and I agree with you. I, I think we could 
from our interests, handle, I don't want to say handle Ukraine, but deal with it, deal with the conflict in the Middle East. The thing that might might disrupt the world order is if the global cop or the most prosperous economy, the multicultural democracy, whatever you want to call us, starts to fall apart at the seams. What What is the cancer here? I, I think I, to the extent that there's an answer, that there's one answer um, that, that matters to me, I'll, I, I have it and I'll give it to you. But I want to say a couple things that I think will have, help set the stage for that answer, which is that, you know, I, I, I travel around the world a lot. Uh, and talk with foreign leaders uh, in the way that you talk to, you know, a lot of students, a lot of business leaders here in the United States. And and there's an analogy. Every leader I talk to of every U.S. ally is deeply concerned about the state of U.S. democracy and believes that if Trump wins, there is going to be chaos against the context of a couple of major wars that is really dangerous, that's really problematic. They don't want it. And yet, they are unwilling to say any of that publicly because, well, Trump might win and then they're going to have to work with him, which feels just like the way CEOs talk about it, which feels just like the way Republicans in Congress talk about it. And so you do have this collective action problem of it's getting worse and worse incrementally and we normalize it. We normalize all of it. And the reason being is because we have lots of good reasons good reasons in the near term that our own personal interests, business interests, national interest tell us that, well, someone else should deal with that problem because we've got to go along to get along. And I, I, that's not the reason for the problem, but there are a lot of things that are facilitating it getting worse. And this is one of them. You know, I mean, American allies, if they really care about us, they should be out there saying, you guys cannot allow your democracy to implode. And no, we think that Trump is a real danger. Because I mean, if all of the leaders of these countries around the world were to say publicly what they are saying to me privately, that would have an impact on on the way the average American thinks about this election going forward. It would, but they won't say it. If all the corporate leaders were to do that, it would have an impact, but they won't say it. If, if Republicans that felt that way privately said it, it would have an impact, but they won't say it. And so all you have are the partisans saying it, and it's in their interest anyway, and so nobody believes it. And I mean, it does seem to me that if you have an election where the former president who did everything in his w capacity to overturn illegally a free and fair election is then running again, in any normal well-functioning democracy, that would be the number one issue. But the United States is not a normal well-functioning democracy, so it is not the number one issue. Now, you, you mentioned a bunch of stuff that I think all is relevant, and I know that you've been very thoughtful about this. You've written about it. You've spoken about it. You and I have spoken about it. So, of course, I think inequality plays and identity politics plays, uh, but I, I think that if there were one thing I would focus on in the United States that's really made a difference, it would be that over the last 40 years, the nurture part of raising Americans has eroded across the board. That all of the institutions like the family and church and community groups and Little League and all of the rest, like those institutions have gotten weaker and more atomized and our young people are less affected by them. And so we don't, we still have genetics, we still have nature, but nurture's falling down on the job in the United States. We don't have that in a way that Japan still does, in a way that a lot of Europeans still do to a greater degree. And replacing that, for a while, nothing replaced it. But for the last 15 years, something has replaced it, and that's algorithm. And now we're raising people in America through algorithms, algorithmically. Uh, and, and that is not raising them to be good citizens and to be functional as human beings. It's raising them to divide and to hate and to feel anger and to feel tribal um, and to be better consumers and more addicted. But algorithms do not replace nurture. They really don't. And there's no regulation around this. The business models are anti-human. Uh, I think if, if I had to put my finger on one thing, 
it would be replacing nurture with algorithm. I like that. Or uh, I think that's really a great word, nurture. Uh, David Brooks has written eloquently on this for a long time. Yeah. And I find that the left is afraid to talk about the importance of church and community and nod their head to the importance of dual parent homes for fear that it comes across as being, I don't know, not not progressive. What do you think of the idea of, of national service, mandatory national service as a means of trying? Yeah, I love it. I love it. No, I love it. Uh, I mean, I talk with Chris Coons, who's one of my best friends in Washington about this all the time. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, the Peace Corps. Uh, it doesn't have to be military, uh, but it has to be some form of volunteerism that's civic. Young people need to be a part of something that is bigger than themselves. One of the reasons Israel has been so successful for its own citizens, not for the Palestinians, obviously, is because everyone has to engage in service. That's where, that's where you meet everybody. It's a leveler. And, and by the way, one of the things that's been positive about this war in Gaza, and there's almost nothing that's been positive, is that the far right in Israel, the Hasidim, who used to always say we don't want any part in national service, are now increasingly saying, no, we, we don't want that exception. We think that we need to actually fight like everybody else does. We can't be free riders. We need to be a part of the country. And that will help integrate the Israeli people together to a greater degree. I think that's important. So before we actually talk about the conflict um, between Israel and Hamas, let's talk about the perception of the conflict here in the U.S. I'm curious if you've been as shocked as I have been um, but I grew up, so I'm Jewish. My mother, maiden name Levine, uh, but I never felt any connection to Judaism or Israel. And if someone had said to me, I have quite a few Jewish friends who talk fairly frequently about anti-Semitism and it's still all over the world and we're still rife with this, this rot that is anti-Semitism. And quite frankly, I always said, I don't see it. I don't feel it. I think you're overplaying your hand and being a little bit paranoid. And then this happens, October 7th happens, and I have been profoundly rattled and just flummoxed at the level of anti-Semitism in the U.S. One, what has been your reaction to or your thoughts around, and, and do you agree with that, at this level of, well, let's not even call it anti-Semitism, let's call it anti-Israel sentiment in the U.S. 70% of people my age support Israel, 20% of people under the age of 25, 18 to 24 year olds, 50 percent support Hamas. What is what is your reaction to this? Uh, America's response, if you will, since October the seventh, and where do you think it comes from? Again, what if you can? What is going on here? Well, um, it, it's complicated. I, I'm not going to sit here and say that anti-Semitism is not a big structural problem in the United States. Um, it obviously is. We saw it with the Tree of Life attack, the Pittsburgh synagogue, which was shocking in terms of the level of violence. People were not ready for that, and that was well before October 7th. Uh, I'm not Jewish. Uh, I was raised Catholic. But I've faced a lot of anti-Semitism for people that assume I'm a Jew. I don't know, because I'm intellectual and have glasses, um, uh, mostly on social media, but not only. I mean, death threats and the rest, which has kind of been shocking to me, right? It's, not, it's, it's Obviously, if, if you're hitting that, that to me, then I mean, just imagine what my Jewish friends are getting hit with, right? So I, I, I get that. I, I think that the anti-Israeli sentiment is much more understandable. The United States is quite isolated in its level of support for Israel today. Uh, other countries around the world, including most U.S. allies, do not support this government to anywhere close to the degree that the United States does politically. Um, part of that is Netanyahu's democratic failings inside his country, the judiciary, the corruption, all of the rest. Some well, of that right has bigotry, right? Absolutely. Extremism and bigotry on the Knesset, right? And, and, and some of and this is earned. Members, members of his own cabinet who are calling for ethnic cleansing of Gaza, which is the opposite of what the United States should be standing for. We don't know what our values are anymore today in America, which is part of this top risk. 
Um, but but to the extent that we have values that we've believed in historically, ethnic cleansing, you know, let's leave aside the treatment of the natives in the United States, but we, we don't believe that that's what we actually stand for. That's not Those aren't the values enshrined to the Declaration of Independence, ethnic cleansing. So that's a problem, that, that Netanyahu's government re- represents that. But also we in the United States like underdogs. You see it in March Madness, and we love the Cinderella 16. Um, You see it in Ukraine. You know, we we didn't, we thought they were going to lose, and we're trying to help get Zelensky out. And then he says, no, I don't need a ride. I need ammo. Um, And and they fight, and we say, you know what, we're going to stand up for these guys, because, you know, we don't care much about Ukraine, but we support the underdog, and we don't like the idea the Russians are coming in and destroying these people. And, you know, Israel has been making this argument that they face an existential threat from Hamas, and it's not true. It's not true. Um, they, They faced more violence against the civilian population in the most brutal possible form that any Jews have seen since the Holocaust on October 7th. And and we must condemn that without any caveat. But Israel has the ability to defend itself. And the reason they didn't defend themselves is because Netanyahu took his eye off the ball, supported Hamas, and took the IDF and the border controls off of Gaza and focused on taking more land of the Palestinians in the West Bank with the settler populations so that he could stay in power because that was the nature of his coalition government. Now, Israel has by far the strongest military in the Middle East, largely through their own capacity, but also bolstered and supported by the U.S. Their defenses, Iron Dome, we provide that support. We help them defend themselves. The Israelis have a right to self-defense. Of course they do. The Palestinians also should have a right to defend themselves. They should have a right to govern themselves, but they do not have that right. And I think that a lot of Americans, especially young Americans, who are increasingly cynical about the legitimacy of American institutions, look at what's happening to the Palestinians and say, yeah, these horrible things were done to the Israelis. Yes, yes, okay. I don't believe that a majority of young people are sympathetic to Hamas. You will find that on social media, and it will be exploited and expanded by people that can't stand them. I get it. But that's not the majority. But I think the majority of young people look at these Palestinians and they say, wow, Israel's rich and they've got all these weapons. And they don't care what happens to these Palestinians. They're going to defend themselves. And it doesn't matter how many Palestinians die. And and Biden has slowly but surely, and Blinken, come to try to understand that sentiment of the United States supporting an underdog. That I think that's a big part of what young people are feeling in the United States today. I don't, I don't think we should be surprised by it. In some ways, we should be inspired by it, but we need to channel it much more constructively um, than what we're seeing today. So I, I think it's difficult. A lot of people will say there's a difference between anti-Semitism and being anti-Israel, and that is a legitimate fair point. And I've been, and I know you have, critical of Netanyahu. And I mean... <laughs> I think you're a little bit younger than me, but we're kind of the same age. Yeah, absolutely. For Israel among our generation, I think was the 67 war and fighting back against Goliath. It was 72 as Munich. They were the good, you know, they were the good guys. And they and were slowly the but surely. And they were the underdogs. That's yeah, right. And, and slowly but surely, they've kind of transitioned to the bad guys, uh, at least in the eyes of, of, of younger Americans. And the eyes of the world. Do you, do you sense, though, what I sense, and that is, I'll use a recent current event. I think it was Suleiman, I forget his name, the Iranian uh, senior security um, uh, officer who was taken out by a U.S. drone. Qasem Suleiman, and they had, a, yeah. they had a memorial forum, terrorism, I think 100 plus people killed, front page. And then, and it's getting tons of coverage, and then they find out ISIS, ISIS takes credit for it. Right. And then it just disappears. Yeah. And I interpreted it, and maybe this is incorrect, but I interpreted it as, Oh, it's just Muslims killing Muslims. That's okay. But when Jews do something, it gets much more scrutiny and a much finer eye. And I joked on my, and this is, well, I, I, I used a, an analogy that if you wanted to bring more attention to the fentanyl crisis, just start a conspiracy theory that Jews are responsible for trafficking it. 
I'm sure that Alex Jones same- has already done that, right? I mean, so we just need to. We just need to. <laughs> That's her when you compare it. me to Alex Jones. <laughs> but it de- it seems to me that, and I look at this war. Israel is not allowed to win a war. They're allowed to respond to aggression and 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 prosecute it to a truce, and then they're expected to to okay now hold up. Whereas when uh, Al Qaeda comes in and kills 2,800 Americans, we respond by killing 400,000 people. World War II, I mean, you can just go on and on and on, that they are held to a different, Israel is held to a different higher standard. The people have decided that essentially the last true Christians in the world should be Jews. I sense a double standard. Do you see that same double standard, or is there, is there more play here? Um, I think the reason that it got more coverage when people thought it might have been Israel, and it made no sense, no experts would have thought it was Israel because it was not a targeted military assassination or attack. It was a whole bunch of civilians getting killed. That's not the way Israel engages in fights. So it it should have been obvious this wasn't Israel. It got coverage, I think, in part because of the focus on what Israel is doing. And some of that, I'm sure, is anti-Semitism, informed by anti-Semitism, but also because if it was Israel, it was very likely to significantly escalate the war. And that has a very meaningful impact for the United States, for our economy, for our troops in the region, all the rest. So I think it was very legitimate that it got a lot more attention. And when it's Muslims on Muslims, yeah, we don't care. We should care, but we don't care. And that reflects Islamophobia and a different value of Muslim life um, out there in the Middle East or in the Global South, Indonesia, Nigeria, you name it, than if it's people that look like us, like the Ukrainians who are Europeans and white. So, I mean... I would I would not solely put that focus on on the question as you raised it, uh, but I think it's part of it. Um, so I mean, is there a double standard? Uh, the Americans should have taken out Al Qaeda. That was perfectly reasonable. Uh, a twenty year war against Afghanistan, not to mention Iraq, which had nothing to do with the fight. Uh, does not seem like a legitimate response by the United States. Now, the U.S., of course, operates on a different standard because the U.S. is the most powerful country in the world, and all other countries rely on it to different degrees. So you can criticize the United States, but if you're a government, in many cases, you've got to suck it up. That is not the case for Israel, right? Israel is in a much stronger position today because they have normalized relations through the Abraham Accords, for example, and so that geopolitically they were in a much better position than they have been at any point since independence before the October 7th event, and some of that is still true today, um, though they've done damage to it. But I, I think very few people, I mean, if Israel were a different country, were not a Zionist Jewish state, but instead were another dominant military country um, that we felt neutral towards and someone uh engaged in terrorism against them and killed you know uh, a thousand of their citizens and they respond with a multi-month war that kills tens of thousands of civilians i think you get outrage absolutely i think you get outrage and in in to a degree that outrage has been minimized by the fact that the United States is an incredibly powerful protector of Israel, and the Israeli government has the ability to say, screw you to everybody else, because they have that support from the United States, which they know will not go anywhere. They know is not at threat. In in the form of two carrier strike forces sitting offshore, right? (laughs) For example, and not only, but also intelligence cooperation and continued provision of critical uh, defense materials like Iron Dome and all the rest. So all of that is real. I mean, Israel is the one country that has a nuclear, a significant nuclear force and has never admitted to actually having a nuclear force. Is that a double standard in Israel's favor that they're allowed to do that? Uh, Yeah, probably. But I mean, historically, it's because, you know, there are good reasons for us to support the existence of an Israeli state where Jews can defend themselves. And that comes out of the Holocaust. I, I feel that history, but it's hard for that That history doesn't last forever, and especially when their own government is undermining their own democratic values and is committing atrocities against civilians. And yes, Hamas is also responsible even for those atrocities because they operate in those civilian areas and they put their own people at risk. But anyone who thinks that the civilian casualties are only the responsibility of Hamas and not of the Israeli government at all is crazy. Like, that's not acceptable. And and that's a position the Americans were on the wrong side of two months ago. 
and that Tony Blinken is trying to tack back ineffectually because he doesn't have a lot of influence, but he's more aligned with uh, most of the world and many, many Americans as a consequence of doing that. This is a no win for Biden. And I think it's going to affect the elections. And I think it's going to undermine him. And that is that is if the war stays where it is. But you said, where'd the war going? Far more likely this war is going to expand going forward. If it does, in fact, become a regional conflict, where do you think that where do you think that fires up and what do you think happens? Do you think we're slowly but surely being drawn into a, a regional conflict? Do you think, because my sense is the Arab states other than uh, Iran don't have appetite for that as well. Iran doesn't have appetite for it either. Um, the, the big states don't want it. Um, the Israeli war cabinet is more tolerant of it. Um, the Houthis in Yemen certainly are moving in that direction. Um, and Hamas and Hezbollah are increasingly moving. Uh, Hamas is all in, and Hezbollah is increasingly moving in that direction. But isn't Hezbollah effectively a proxy force for Iran? Um, yes, but proxy force is does not mean that they are being ordered. I mean, the Iranians have been very happy to continue to provide weapons and for these forces to attack Israel. Yes, and the United States. But Iran does not want to be involved in that fight itself. Uh, that's somewhat analogous to the United States with Ukraine and NATO with Ukraine, right? Um, but at some point, if this war continues, um, the Iranians could easily get involved. Now, we're several steps away from that. If the United States start attacking the Houthis in their bases in Yemen, we get a little bit closer. Um, if the Iranian proxies in Syria and Iraq start attacking American bases with significant casualties on the part of American servicemen and women, we get closer. If the Israelis engage in direct strikes against Iran, not like the ISIS attack, but you know targeted military strikes, we get closer. If Trump becomes the nominee and starts calling for direct military attacks against Iran and the Republicans move in that direction, we get closer. Um, I mean... You know, if Hezbollah and is involved in a direct war uh, with Israel and the U.S. is providing lots of intelligence support and some uh, military uh, support, even if they're not directly involved in the fighting, we get closer. Now, none of that is a regional war with the Americans fighting Iran. If we get into a, a hot war between the Americans and the Iranians, Biden is going to lose and we'll be in a global recession and oil prices will be 150, 200 or more. We're several steps away from that, but but we are not, as I said, I don't think we land where we are right now. I think we land in between those two places with a risk that uh, an all-out war is, is possible. I, I think that's, that's where we are. This is a, a horribly dangerous environment. Biden hates it. He knows it's a problem, but there's actually very little he can do to stop it. That's what we've seen over the last three months, is that he's been very ineffectual in being able to contain Israeli decision makers. We'll be right back. So you've been very indulgent with me. I'm obviously very preoccupied with um, Israel and Hamas, so we'll do a lightning round on some of these oh, other issues. Oh, I don't mind at all. That's fine. Yeah. So you wrote in your kind of your risk for 2024 that you thought um, Ukraine would be partitioned. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I fear that that is not going to go over well um, among a lot of people that um, are all in for Ukraine. Uh, it has been, I mean, you can get pasted pretty badly publicly uh, for for not being seen as sufficiently patriotic in your support for Ukraine. I, I want to be very clear that when I say that Ukraine is going to be partitioned, I do not believe that is right. It is not just. I do not favor it. Um, I want the Ukrainians to be able to take back all of their territory. I believe they should be able to do so. Um, but it's not going to happen. And I'm not going to lie to people. And there are lots of things that we don't like that we find unacceptable, but we have to live with. North Korea has nuclear weapons. We've said it's unacceptable. Okay, that's not a policy. You know, Taliban can't run Afghanistan 20 years later. There they are, Assad's in Syria. So Ukraine's going to be partitioned, but it's not going to be accepted or recognized by Ukraine or by the Americans or by most of the Europeans. It might be by some. And Zelensky is likely to get increasingly desperate 
as a consequence of that. And that's even before we start talking about a potential President Trump, who, if he wins, NATO is going to get fragmented and Ukraine is going to be thrown under the bus and the Poles and the Balts and the Finns and the Swedes are going to be very, very deeply concerned about that in a way that NATO will not be providing support, the U.S. will not be providing support. So I, I think that there's, there's a lot of time pressure right now on Zelensky, and the average age of a Ukrainian draftee today is about 45. It was 26 when the war started. They only have 44 million people. Uh, I mean, their ability to keep fighting to maintain even the 82% of the territory that they now control is going to get a lot harder. So, um, yeah, looking forward, I mean, the last two years, I would argue, I would give Biden an A minus in the way he's managed the Ukraine war since 2022. I think he's done a good job, especially in marshalling bipartisan support in the U.S. and broad support among American allies, not just in NATO, but even countries like Japan and Australia and South Korea has gotten a lot of support for Ukraine, and he's kept those countries all together and on side. I think that's now starting to fall apart, fall apart domestically, fall apart internationally, not helped by the fact that Ukraine's counteroffensive, much vaunted and expected, was a failure. Um, and Putin knows it, and he, and he knows that he needs to hang tight to see if Trump wins, in which case he's hit the jackpot. So, and, and you know, we, we're 40 minutes into the conversation before you're even asking me about Ukraine. It's not what you're interested in. I remember when the war was, you know, just about to start and I was with you in Miami and we had this conversation and everyone's like, it's going to be okay. I'm like, no, this is going to be a fucking disaster. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but like, you know, the next few days, this war is going to start. Then the war started. Um, and that was pretty intense. But Americans, this is, this is not a priority right now. The Middle East is the priority. Blinken's been, you know, in Israel four times since October 7th. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, the Secretary of Defense, when he's not uh, missing uh, in the hospital, has been traveling to the Middle East. Um, the National Security Advisor, uh, they're not going to Ukraine. Uh, and if they're not worried about the Middle East, they're worried about the elections. So, I mean, Ukraine is a distant third maybe even fourth these days compared to the border issue on some on some weeks, you're just not going to be able to continue to provide the Ukrainians the support they need to fight this war. That's, that's where we're going. I mean, hasn't Russia at the end of the day leveraged their core competence and that is a willingness to endure patience. just an immense amount of suffering yep. and patience? Yes, they have, Scott. Yes, they have. But, but they are not winning. They will be able to take over a fair amount of territory in Ukraine. Mm -hmm at the expense of NATO having expanded significantly, yeah, far more of their border, border they should defend. Yeah. They lost a third of their kinetic power. I mean, it's been, a, they've lost an inc incredible reputational capital, right? Frozen half force. of their international assets, can't trade with Europe anymore, can't send gas, is going to be uh, stranded. They won't have the pipelines to send it anyplace else. A million of their population fleeing, so that they have capable, smart men that they need for their economy. I mean, this has been a horrible situation for Russia. Let's go to China real quick. A thesis, you respond to it. Uh, the West has an inflation problem or a threat of inflation uh, rebounding. China has a growth problem. Our IP, our capital, our consumer economy, their manufacturing economy. Wouldn't the greatest tax cut in history be for uh, a thaw in the relations between U.S. and China? And don't they have a mutual interest that just brings them back together in 2024? There, I think, is a mutual interest to at least manage the relationship more effectively. A thaw is hard to imagine. They don't trust each other at all. There are lots of areas of conflict that are zero-sum. The Taiwan relationship, depending on how the election goes next week, would be one big piece of that. South China Sea, territorial issues, um, and the export controls the U.S. is putting in place on semiconductors, cloud computing, and other pieces of advanced technology that the Chinese don't have access to. So th these are hard things to unwind. But uh, given the economic challenges, given the geopolitical dangers in the rest of the world, and given the United States election coming up, neither Biden nor Xi are looking for yet another crisis. And I think that the flurry of 
high-level bilateral engagement we've seen between the United States and China on the diplomatic, economic, and military fronts over the past months is likely to persist through the election. It will not create an entente, it will not create a breakthrough, but it will be a better managed relationship than it had been for most of the first three years of the Biden administration. You also wrote, and this really struck me, and we disagree on this issue, your predictions, that my prediction was totally contrary to this, to the one, the risk you outlined. You think there's going to be a rebound or that inflation will persist in 24? Say more. Yeah, um, I, I think that it's going to uh, persist more than the markets presently think. I think the markets are pricing in more uh, more reduction uh, in interest rate by the U.S. Central Bank, by the Fed, um, than, than we believe is going to happen. Um, I think that the geopolitical risks that I spoke about are going to cause more supply chain challenges. I think that the, um, the, the likelihood of un, unforeseen risks the last two years, we've had Russia, Ukraine. The last year, we had Israel, Hamas. I think there's going to be more in this environment. And I think that makes it more challenging to suddenly bring rates down significantly. Uh, what we say is no room for error. In other words, everything has to go kind of right for the markets to be correct about the, the soft landing that is going to be engineered in the United States. And I would bet on uh, that not being as successful. This is a comparatively low risk in our report. It's only number eight, number eight out of 10, and it involves the whole world and especially the United States. And given that we measure our risks on the basis of likely imminence and impact, that means that we're not saying no room for error is an American recession. What we're saying is that right now we believe the markets are priced for perfection, especially around the Fed. And we expect that, that the, the reality of that outcome is going to disappoint somewhat on the downside. Yeah, to your point, the market is pricing in several rate cuts in 24. For a lot. Yeah, exactly. And, but I would, I would argue, and I'd like you to respond to this, that because these conflicts have been go going on for a while, that a lot of supply chains have demonstrated agility. And for example, a lot of Mexico is now our largest trading partner. It's That's no great. longer China. Yep. People are saying there was so little slack in the system. Everything was so optimized for costs that when, whether it was COVID or a war in Ukraine, we found that the part for garage doors or batteries, it just totally mucked up or gunked up the supply chain. And slowly but surely, I see corporations ungunking or creating more diversification, heterogeneity in their supply chain. In addition... I think AI is highly deflationary because if you look at inflation, one of the stickiest parts, at least in the U.S. of inflation, has been wage pressure. And I think people in services industries are going to have a lot, not on the front lines, but I'm talking about lawyers, sort of like, you know, white collar services are going to have much less confidence asking for raises as they look around over their shoulder at generative AI and worry that their job's about to be replaced. I, I see, I, I think we might actually have deflation in 24. What are your thoughts? It's interesting. Uh, I find your second argument very compelling. I don't know if it comes fast enough. I, 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 th I thought it was very interesting and a little surprising to me to see how far and hard um, the UAW was willing to fight at a time for much higher wages and win and benefits at a time when electric vehicles and drivetrain and batteries and all of the rest are, are, are going to push for far less skilled, less well-paid workers. Uh, I mean, that has the potential to really backlash for them, but we didn't do it. And, and that implied to me that um, as much as this AI uh, and new technology train, which is coming, which is massive, which is going to be deflationary, um, until it is really seen at scale, labor has, if they've got, if they're in a position where they have an advantage, they're going to use it. And they're not going to think long-term and strategically. So I'm not sure this plays out in 2024, but I agree completely with your analysis. I think it's coming. I think the question is when it's coming, how it's coming. Um, I agree with your ungunking and creation of resilience in supply chains, but I also see huge political drivers uh, of industrial policy, national policies, subsidies that are increasing costs dramatically in that new environment. This is not a free trade environment. 
this is an environment where even the Americans and the Europeans are hitting each other with tariffs and hitting each other with export controls and, you know, carbon border adjustment mechanisms that the Europeans have, which don't work well with the Americans, are going to hurt the global south, global south with critical minerals, and they want to get up the supply chain, so they're going to make it much more costly for you to do that new business. I mean, the politics are really invasive here, and they create significant costs. Now, some of those costs create redistribution, which is necessary for the social contract. Some of it is nationalism, corruption, and wasted. And I don't have a good sense of, you know, where the balance of the scale falls between those two, but I know it's costly in the, in the near term. I, I don't think either of us is right or wrong on this. I think that the truth is in yeah, between, but it's a question of when it's going to hit, right? That's the issue. You mentioned the upcoming election in Taiwan, which I would argue is the most underreported um, story relative to its importance. What, in your view, is the biggest risk that is getting no coverage right now? Yeah, uh, Taiwan is, I think, getting a fair amount of coverage, um, but it's, you know, among I would bet 90% of China. Americans don't even know there's an election. I think a lot of people have heard about the election. They don't know when it is, but they've heard, oh, yeah, Taiwan elections. I think people have said it because, you know, there's been a lot of conversation in Congress about war and the Pelosi visit and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's played out. Um, the, the fact is that um, there's a 50-50 chance that the guy that is pro-independence, though he was not going to put it that way, is not going to win. So, I mean, next week, that risk could go away. Um, and if he does win, I, I think that there will be some trade challenges and there may be at the the extreme some inspections of boats some forcible boarding by the chinese more exercises but i think this stuff is manageable because of the reason so what's the risk what's mentioned? the risk or, we're not talking about well i mean there are definitely risks we're not talking about one that doesn't matter but it matters a lot locally is the horn of africa doesn't matter economically or strategically, but Ethiopia is about to be at war with Somalia because they're going to recognize a breakaway secessionist province that's going to give them access to Portway. I mean, no one's going to care. It's not going to get any attention, but it really matters if you're right. Ethiopian or Somalian. I mean, I, I don't know. I think that that's a pretty big deal. Um, North Korea it gets very little attention. I mean, it was Kim Jong-un's birthday, by the way. I think it's kind of cool that um, these three rogue states I talk about, North Korea, Iran, and Russia, their leaders are all five foot seven. I think that's interesting. You know, nobody <laughs> talks about different that. Different sizes, different sizes and shapes, though. Small man syndrome, and, though. Maybe that's the biggest risk that no one's talking about is small man syndrome. I paint the optimistic case around 24 in the U.S. What do you think the optimistic... I find that when generally speaking, when we're really worried about stuff, that the yeah. market and the world climbs the wall of worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it strikes me that when we're most worried and most anxious about things, that things usually, it's the shit you're not expecting that hits you hard, right? It feels like we're expecting such doom and disaster. I've never felt such negative sentiment going into 24, and I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or because things are really scary right now. But what's the optimistic scenario for the U.S. through 24? Well, the realistic optimistic scenario is that Biden, either Biden wins big um, or Nikki Haley gets the nomination on the Republican side and then she wins big. Either of those two would be optimistic scenarios. I think they're very unlikely, um, like sub 10%, but they could happen. And, and that's a jackpot. Like if Nikki Haley is able to come in a very strong second or even first in New Hampshire, take South Carolina, get a wall of money. She's suddenly the favorite. People can become favorites very, very quickly. Trump attacks her, attacks her, attacks her, throws her a whole bunch more attention. She is now getting huge attention in the United States. People are plausibly talking about her as the first woman president. Um, yeah, I think she beats Biden too. Oh, she, she, she crushes Biden. It's not even close. But, I mean, then you have a free and fair election, and Trump is a washed-up loser after four elections that he can't get right. And, you know, he's still facing legal jeopardy, and maybe she pardons him, but she pardons him in part with a promise that he goes away. That would be huge. I, I think it's very unlikely. The other unlikely scenario is Biden wins by such a large margin that Trump and his supporters who refuse to accept it go nowhere, and the Republican Party jettisons Trump 
Trump may create his own party in that environment, uh, but he only has a group of Rump supporters and the Republican Party falls apart and eventually coalesces into something else and Trump is irrelevant. But you do have like, you know, paramilitary crazies in the U.S., but they're not an extant threat to the system. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that. And you no longer have Biden is, you know, too old to be president, but he allows somebody else to take over after a year, after two years. And then you move to an, another generation um, that won't resolve the deep seated challenges that Americans have that you and I talked about earlier in the conversation. But it gives us some breathing room. Right. And right now, this is a country that needs breathing room. This is a country that really does not need to have an election in 2024. This election we we'd all be much happier if this election were in 2028 right for every reason we don't want this election right now so and i recognize this statement is rife with bias but i think there's some legitimacy and some veracity behind it don't all the rivers of risk kind of lead to the amazon of risk and that is the re-election of donald trump no no i think that that is a bias because trump in my view is of course it's much worse if trump wins i get that but but he is not the problem. He is a symptom of a much bigger structural challenge in the world's largest democracy, which is dysfunctional. It is not in crisis because of Trump. Trump has taken advantage of a system that is weak and vulnerable and deteriorating and eroding that people don't believe in. And you need to turn that around. That That, I think, is the problem. It's too easy to blame this on a guy. I I don't great point. believe that that is where we are, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, I'm not just saying that. I, this also, mm -hmm. you you say that it involves a bias, uh, but you think it's true. Mm -hmm. My response involves a bias. My bias mm -hmm. is I don't want to broad brush as irredeemable a large percentage of the American population. I believe these people are misled, but they're also angry for legitimate reasons. And those reasons must be addressed or they will become uh, increasingly hostile um, and threatening. I think that is, uh, we've seen that play out over and over and over again. And the threat doesn't come in the final version from those people. It comes from the elites that take advantage and can channel the rage and get the support and power from those people. And that is where we're heading in the United States. Yeah, to your point, I think it would be a disaster for America if Trump is removed from the Colorado and Maine ballots. I agree. That strikes me as, as uh, I mean, last time that happened, uh, they were trying to remove Lincoln from ballots and started a civil war. Yeah. Most important, Ian, what are your New Year's resolutions for 24? What's, what's up with the world of Ian Bremmer and the Eurasia Group? Well, that's why I started with the South Pole. I thought that, you know, a week and a half of no internet um, was really, really valuable. <laughs> and now you're working your way north? Nah, I mean, just, just, you know, you and I have talked about how polarizing and how toxic social media is. And I recognize for what I do, for what you do, it's very important to be able to get our voice out there. It would, it's not feasible um, to be relevant and to have influence and to be off, but it's not good for my psyche. Uh, and I say that as somebody who does not really get worked up. But I just don't, it just depresses me to see all of this misinformation and hate constantly. So to get away, completely away, and to read, you know, some big think books about philosophy and consciousness and Anything who we that sticks are. out that you especially enjoyed while you were frolicking uh, with penguins? I really enjoyed that book by Watts uh, from, I think it was 1953, the one that had the intro from Deepak Chopra. It was about the uh, the wisdom of insecurity. I thought it was wonderful. It was a great book to read at the bottom of the planet. It was a great book to book to to talk about like how irrelevant our worries, our concerns are about the future and about the past and what it means to be in the present, what it means to engage and enjoy what we have right now, which is all we actually have and ever have. I thought that was a wonderful way to start the year. So this was not a year of resolutions for me. This was a year of resetting, of reviving, of revitalizing. I was consciously aware of how hard 2024 is going to be, especially not for you and me, but for people you and I care about, for people that you and I touch. And we have to be resilient. We have to have energy. We have to reset to be there, to have the strength for those people. 
You know, we've got to be able to give and not lash out over a really challenging year. And uh, I thought that the best way for me to do that um, was uh, to really recharge. Uh, that was, uh, that's what I tried to do. Ian Bremmer is the president and founder of Eurasia Group, the world's leading political risk research and consulting firm, and G Zero Media, a company dedicated to providing intelligent and engaging coverage of international affairs. He is also the author of 11 books, including his latest, The Power of Crisis, How Three Threats and Our Response Will Change the World. He joins us from New York. Ian, as always, it is great to converse with you, and welcome back from the South Pole. And most importantly, he cares a lot about you, Scott. Uh, you're a really good guy. I love what you do. It's always a joy to spend some time either privately or publicly um, as we do. And it's nice to kick this off uh, with you again. <laughs>